Chapter 6 Railroads Deployed, Learning from Experience The rapid movement of trains must inevitably generate in travelers a brain disease, a special variety, or the delirium furiosum. If travelers are nevertheless determined to brave this fearful danger, the state must at least protect the onlookers, for otherwise these will be affected with the same brain disease at the sight of the rapidly running steam wagon. It is therefore necessary to enclose the railway on both sides with a high, tight board fence. Bavarian College of Physicians, 1832. 6.1. Trials and Errors. Manchester, England has been called the first industrial city, and the Industrial Revolution transformed this region more than others, with a population that doubled between 1801 and 1831. By 1824, Manchester had 30,000 power looms and was importing 400,000 bales of cotton. The cotton mills led to an engineering industry that first built textile machinery and branched out, a chemical industry starting with dyes and then expanding, and a financial services industry that funded those in other sectors. Just down the Mersey River, Liverpool served as the primary port connecting England with the Americas. The inland waterways of canals and rivers that connected Manchester with Liverpool were strained, and Manchester businessman sought congestion relief. A Liverpool to Manchester cableway was proposed, and William James had begun surveys in 1822, a few years before the Stockton and Darlington opened. George Stevenson replaced William James on the Liverpool to Manchester line in 1824, and his plans went to Parliament in 1825. After overcoming much opposition from landowners and road and canal interests, an act was passed in 1826 and construction began. Cable haulage was sure to work, and it had to be used in a tunnel connecting the station in Liverpool with the docks due to the steep grade and lack of ventilation. But there was a concern about its use on the main line. It would provide excess capacity if traffic was light in the early days. Cables were not scalable, both upward and downward, in the same way locomotives were. Locomotives could be provided to scale with the growth up of traffic, but would they be reliable and have the necessary power? The Rainhill trials proved they could. The Rainhill trials were conducted in 1829 to test the promise of locomotive engines to be used for the new Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Locomotives were to run at not less than 16 kilometers per hour, haul cars of three times their weight, adhere to a weight limit, and run the route 20 times to compare roughly with the distance from Liverpool to Manchester, 50 kilometers, without adding fuel or water. Stevenson designed the rocket to compete. It was another even faster locomotive engine. The rocket, shown in the figure, was innovative for its use of multi-tubular boiler, as well as using a chimney to exhaust steam and bring in fresh air for the fire. Because all other competitors failed to finish the race, the rocket won, but that should not diminish its accomplishment. In 1828, the sole surviving signer of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, Charles Carroll, said at the groundbreaking of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, I consider this among the most important acts of my life, second only to my signing the Declaration of Independence, if even it be second to that. It is worth noting that a railroad is just the American version of the English word railway. The U.S. experience was similar to the United Kingdom. New technologies had to prove themselves. In 1830, Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb lost to a horse in the famous race on the B&O due to a minor mechanical failure when a belt slipped off a pulley. But the Iron Horse so impressed executives at the new B&O that it was adopted. While the Tom Thumb was proof of concept and not intended for regular service, other engines were soon perfected. As a sidebar, Peter Cooper himself had an interest in the success of the B&O as he speculatively purchased land in the Canton neighborhood of Baltimore. Cooper, while at this point wealthy, became wealthier. One of his early holdings was a slaughterhouse, of which a byproduct was gelatin, on which he obtained a patent for its use as a dessert. This was later commercialized successfully by others as Jell-O. Dennis Pepin, whom we met earlier, deserves some credit for gelatin as well as an output of his digester. Another byproduct of the slaughterhouse was glue. The animals that were slaughtered included horses, which his technologies helped make jobless. Cooper also founded one of the premier engineering schools, the Cooper Union, in New York City. Competitions have a long history in advancing technology. In addition to the Rainhill Trials and the Race of the Tom Thumb, we have DARPA's Urban Challenge, which we'll talk about in Section 30.4, solar car competitions, or the story of me the measurement of longitude, which greatly aided navigation. On September 15, 1830, 
The opening ceremonies for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway were held. The Prime Minister, the Duke of Wellington, cabinet members, members of Parliament, and other assorted dignitaries were present. Among those were a member of Parliament from Liverpool and a 60-year-old former leader of the House of Commons and cabinet member, William Huskisson. The dignitaries had been riding on a train pulled up by one of Stevenson's rockets. Reports differ, but Lady Wilton, an observer on the same train, wrote to Fanny Kimball, quote, The engine had stopped to take a supply of water, and several of the gentlemen in the director's carriage had jumped out to look about them. Lord Wilton, Count Bathany, Count Madisonitz, and Mr. Huskisson, among the rest, were standing talking in the middle of the road, when an engine on the other line, which was parading up and down merely to show its speed, was seen coming down upon them like lightning. The most active of those in peril sprang back into their seats. Lord Wilton saved his life only by rushing behind the Duke's carriage, and Count Madison had just leaped into it, with the engine all but touching his heels as he did so, while poor Mr. Huskisson, less active from the effects of age and ill health, bewildered, too, by the frantic cries of stop the engine, clear the track that resounded on all sides, completely lost his head, looked helplessly to the right and left, and was instantaneously prostrated by the fatal machine, which dashed down the thunderbolt upon him and passed over his leg, smashing and mangling it in the most horrible way. Stevenson personally helped Huskisson into a locomotive and trans traversed 15 miles in 25 minutes, 57.9 kilometers per hour, to receive medical attention in the nearby town of Eccles. But it was for naught, Huskisson amended his will and died within the hour. This was not the first death by steam locomotive. It was at least the third, but it was still the most notable. Despite this inauspicious beginning, both passengers and freight services, the latter opened in 1831, were immediate successes. The Liverpool and Manchester rediscovered the passenger market. The route was planned as a freight route, and the amount of passenger demand came as a surprise, even though the Stockton and Darlington had shown latent passenger demand. Indeed, coach operators saw no threat to their business, and unlike the canal interests, did not oppose the construction of the Liverpool and Manchester. The Liverpool and Manchester also altered the common carrier concept. Managing locomotives and schedules required that the railroad own and operate equipment. If brought to the stations, freight of all kinds, FAK, was accepted for shipment, with all charges at set rates. While the railroad attempted to arrange passenger service provision by a coach operator, freight service by a canal operator, the railroad's desire for both control of car training and train schedules and revenue, and tepid support from private operators, led the railroad to elect to operate services, a major reinterpretation of the common carrier tradition championed by canals. Freight cars were built from tram and wagon experiences. First-class passenger cars were, essentially, three-road coach bodies mounted on a flat car. Second-class cars were open-sided cars with roofs. If a traveler wanted his own road coach, it was mounted on a flat car. This chapter watches the rise of the railroads, from the emulation of the first system to learning about networks, technology, passenger travel, freight transport, and embedded policies. Six point two emulation. Andrew Jackson arrived in Washington in 1829 on a carriage and left eight years later on a train. D. W. Howe, 2007. Success followed success, and by the 1850s, a good bit of the fabric of the world's railroads were in operation. The London and Birmingham and the Baltimore and Ohio brought learning further. Each required the establishment of a company of considerable size and the raising of capital in capital markets. The city of Baltimore put up much of the funding for the Baltimore and Ohio. The state of Maryland waived taxes. The problem of locating terminals in large cities and managing large-scale engineering works were confronted and managed. Experiments with the technology continued. Except for learning about organizational structures and distributed management, which occurred later on the Erie and Pennsylvania railroads, the very early railroads pretty much defined the railroad, how it developed, and what it could do. Given the answer to the question of what railroads would be and what they could do, deployment was very rapid. The figure shows the growth of the network in England. As the pace of growth suggests, the system had largely climbed its S-curve by 1880. It should be noted that the overnight success of the railroad was not so overnight from the perspective of the time. It took the B&O three years before ridership exceeded 300 passengers per day, and it wasn't until it was open and operating that much emulation took place. Because the railroads were the first of the modern modes, there was much interesting learning from experience as they dealt with their growth and development problems. Later modes emulated much of what the railroads learned. 
For this reason, learning will be the operative word in our organization of the discussion. Six point three: Learning about networks. The Lagrange Star Plan. The Lagrange Star Plan, centering railroad service on Paris, was produced about 1830 by the French Corps de Pont et Chasseurs. Louis Navier, the leader of the Corps, saw speed as the advantage of rail, and railroads were to move passengers in priority freight in a fashion complementary to canals. He felt that others, especially the Americans and Germans, were not building to high enough physical standards, and the plan called for limited curvature and grades, foreshadowing high-speed rail. But there was a problem. In spite of taxing power, public capital wasn't sufficient to operate high-quality railroads. The compromise was that government would create the fixed facilities and that private companies would provide financing for equipment, stations, and so on. There would be private operations for 99 years, at which time the properties would revert to the state. In practice, there was some compromising of standards to reduce facility costs. 28 companies were created and eventually consolidated into six regional monopolies. To meet the requirements of the plan, main routes cross-subsidized the operation of routes in small markets. State engineers planned the routes, and there were complaints from places not well served. State financing was partial, as mentioned. State engineers also established tariffs and fares, and to an extent, service. Private companies could and did build feeder lines, as was the case with toll roads built in the regions. The point is that the central government took actions in an absolutist way in the spirit of Colbert. These accomplishments were not made without great debate, and there were periods when an anti-statist, anti-elite, liberal, Adam Smith-like forces held power. Anti-statists argued that the time value of money made high-quality facilities inefficient, and that marginal cost ideas should take priority over state-determined prices and cross subsidies. The authority of government engineers versus engineers in the private sector was also debated. Cheaper and better argued for private sector engineers, but even with these debates, absolutism continued. This was in spite of the revolution and Napoleon. Indeed, the Napoleonic legal code, Roman-based, in contrast with English common law, may have eased the implementation of absolutism. Most critics say that France overexpanded its rail facilities and invested in canals long after they ceased to be competitive with rail. High standards for canals resulted in expensive facilities. They did not fit instances where water and or traffic was in short supply. Bismarck's invasion of France in 1870 brought the Paris-centered rail system into question, for the French could not move troops to the front as quickly as the Germans could. As a result, a grand plan was produced in 1880, resulting in a northeast rail corridor from Dunkirk to Nancy. Other critics say that France developed very fine systems as a result of the professionalism of the central government and the engineers' uses of science. There is no question that, from a strictly physical engineering view, the French developed superior facilities using superior knowledge. SNCF was created in 1938, and another round of superior engineering was seen as the railroads were electrified after World War II. 25,000 volt AC transmission converted to DC by locomotive rectifiers. The TGV and today's expressway system followed. The figure illustrates intermodal complementarity in the River Zorn Valley. Side by side are the Rhine Marne Canal, the River Zorn, the road leading to Lutzelburg, and the Paris Strasbourg Railway. Six point four learning about technology. Railroad development began in the US at a time when the predominant technology was still in a hardening phase, and the technology was specialized to the US situation. A key actor was Robert Livingston Stevens, seventeen eighty seven to eighteen fifty nine, son of Robert Stevens, the competitor of Robert Fulton of steamboat fame. Trained in construction and steam technologies by his father, R. L. Stevens was first president and chief engineer of the Camden and Amboy Railroad, later part of the Pennsylvania system incorporated in 1830. Stevens journeyed to England in 1830 to meet Stevenson, and he purchased a Planet Series locomotive, the John Bull, which arrived in the United States in 1831. Stevenson designed the T-Rail, which was known as the Stevens or American Rail, and is now universally used. He also developed the rail spike cross-tie system. The bogey truck and methods of wood preservation were developed on the Camden and Amboy. Also on that railroad was Isaac Drips, the innovator of the cowcatcher, which not only redirected lost livestock, but also, with additional wheels, helped to keep the locomotive on track. Stevens was America's Stevenson, and the Camden and Amboy was in Stockton and Darlington. The hardening of the technology America style also yielded an American locomotive. The U.S. terrain was unsuited to the British locomotive, 
rigid British locomotives did not ride the poorly aligned light American rails very well, nor did they serve well on the sharp turns of mountain passes. They were also designed for coal burning, while wood was abundant in eastern North America. American technology was still imported in the mid-19th century. By 1840, of the 450 locomotives in the United States, 333 were made in the U.S. 3,200 miles, 5,150 kilometers of track, as many as canals, and as many miles as Europe. Much credit for this goes to Stevens. Someone had to develop the American version. To meet the U.S. needs, Henry R. Campbell of Philadelphia developed and patented the American 440 locomotive in 1836. The numbers assigned to the American trains are based on Frederick Methvin White's system of classification. The first number is the number of leading wheels, the middle number is the number of driving wheels, and the last is the number of trailing wheels. Thus, for the 440, there were two leading axles, four wheels, four driving wheels, and no trailing wheels and axles. The chief feature of the American locomotive was a four-wheel, two-axle pivoting truck at the front, which would turn and guide the locomotive around curves. John B. Jervis produced the first versions of the American design. His locomotive was a 420 and weighed about 7 to 10 tons. But within a year or so, the Campbell design evolved to 440s weighing about 15 to 25 tons. The wood versus coal question was touch and go. Initially, coal was expensive in the U.S., but rail service soon began to make anthracite available. Just at the time, though, the demand for coal was affected by rapid growth of the hot blast iron and steel production, which put pressure on anthracite prices. Less expensive wood became the fuel for most railroads, but a few railroads used anthracite. As the technology hardened in a suitable form, railroad construction boomed starting about 1845. The American locomotive dominated American practice through 1900. The weight and power of the locomotive increased by at least a factor of three. Yet the real price remained steady and even fell during some decades. There was a shift from wood to coal fuel at about 1880. There were many American type locomotives still on the properties when diesel replaced steam in the 1950s. Quite a number were exported, some to England. Later, many 480 locomotives used in Europe were based on American designs. One reason for the quick demise of canals was the unusually cold winters of the mid 1840s. There were short shipping seasons just at the time new canals were opening and facing competition from railroads. The U.S. had some major systems integration issues despite being able to follow the lead of England. Because engines were imported from England, many U.S. railroads adopted the standard gauge of 1.435 meters, 4 feet, 8.5 inches. Some southern railroads used 5 foot, 1,525 millimeter. The Erie Railroad used 6 foot, 1,830 millimeter to avoid diversion of traffic, but that was self-defeating. At the beginning of the U.S. Civil War, there were 11 different gauges in the north and an unknown number in the south. A train from Philadelphia to Charleston would have to change gauge eight times. A few larger railroads were built by single companies, for example, the Baltimore and Ohio, the Erie, and the Illinois Central. But the vast majority of lines were short and local. Longer trips would require using the lines of many different organizations. The railroads were aided by grants of public land. At least as significant was the financial support from governments. In 1838, state debts totaling nearly $43 million were attributable to railroads. William Ripley argues that local support was at least as great, and by 1870 was 20% of the total construction expenses to date. Virginia subscribed to 60% of the shares provided the other 40% was taken up by the private sector. A so-called debt repudiation depression began around 1839 and continued to around 1847. The conventional reason given for that depression is the write-down of investments made in canals and some changes in currency and banking policy. While not dismissing these factors, Santini links the depression to the clash between the new and old technology, and in particular to the displacements the use of technology occasioned. From the 40 kilometers of railroad in the U.S. in 1830, in about nine decades, the railroad grew to about 400,000 kilometers. Subsequently, the length has declined to what it was in about 1890. Another American innovation occurred in 1836, when the sleeping car emerged in the Cumberland Valley Railroad. This would prove to be important in the American context, as the trips were significantly longer than in England or Europe. George Pullman essentially invented the hotel on wheels. He attained early notoriety for physically moving the four-story Tremont Hotel in Chicago, raising the building with jacks to match the road. He brought on the sleeping carriage in 1859 on the Chicago and Alton Railroad. Sleeping carriages were heavy in addition to being luxurious, not so much for the beds, but for the wooden furniture and so railroads were required to improve their track and supports to accommodate them. They gained more fame when used on Abraham Lincoln's funeral. Pullman's labor practices led to one of the most violent strikes in U.S. history.
6.5, learning about passenger service standards. Charters for the Liverpool and Manchester and the London and Birmingham were obtained after debates about their diversion of freight from other modes. But diversion of freight was slow and selective. The latent demand for passenger transportation, however, came as a surprise. Recognizing a role in passenger service, the Act of 1844 responded to public claims for rights to travel and set a minimum level of service availability. Known as parliamentary trains, service was to be provided each direction each weekday. Stops were to be made at each station. A maximum fare was set and running speeds were to be not less than 20 kilometers per hour. This was third class service. First and second class service reflected the coach, fly wagon, post horse, freight wagon services available on roads and flyboat service on canals. The classes of passenger service offered by the railroads mirrored canal and road services. They substituted for canal and road services and pretty much captured the market. The same economic rationale continues today. It yields, for example, first business coach and a collection of lower cost special fares and air transport. Jules Dupuy considered a situation where there's a fixed cost of providing service. Using concepts of consumer surplus and utility differentiated among users, he concluded the wisdom of differentiated tolls for differentiated passengers. The idea of price discrimination, referred to today as Ramsey or inverse elasticity prices. Railroads found demand and cost such that they could lower fares and upgrade service. Although figure 6.5 does not reflect early experiences, it shows the consequence of railroad actions. Low fare services grew very rapidly, while in absolute terms, high fare services withered. Things were improving and there was no need for central government action with one exception. The railroads found the obligation of the 1844 Act onerous especially the requirement to stop at every station. They pressed for relief and obtained it in an 1866 Act. However, there was a trade-off. As railroads asked for relief, some were required to operate workmen's trains in the vicinity of large cities. More on that later. We have seen policy stated as a minimum level of service requirement, a standardized requirement, one policy fits all situations. Requirements for minimal level of service policy are mooted if service performance improves, as it does in the early days of a system. Policy revision and the use of trade-offs to obtain revision. Experience said offered differentiated services and custom and tradition have caused differentiated services to continue. More generally, what had been learned in the pre-rail experience was incorporated in the rail experience and modified in a pragmatic way, and the rail experience led to additional modifications. Six point six learning about freight rate making. In the case of roads, the local justices of the peace were required to set maximum freight rates and service conditions by the 1691 Act. This was early in the development of wagon trade, and the concern was that wagoners were setting rates at excessive levels. It seems likely that they were. One had to have considerable for the time's capital to enter the business, and competition must have been limited. The wagoners had mutual interests, and the price rigging must have taken place off and on. The experience setting rates and service conditions was reflected in canal and turnpike charters. The canal firms and turnpike trusts were not allowed to monopolize the boat, wagon, and carriage business. Maximum tolls were set and later refined. Road tolls, for example, had some relation to cost. They were computed on the basis of wagon wheel width and tons. Flyboats paid higher tolls than freight boats. In river navigation projects, there was a tendency towards complex tolls that charged according to value. From a policy point of view, the Stockton and Darlington was a canal. Anyone with equipment could use the track. Maximum tolls were set. These conditions were carried over to the Manchester and Liverpool Charter, but the anyone can use policy was never implemented. The London and Birmingham Charter simply required the railroad to carry all freight brought to its docks. At this point in time, the system took off, and by 1850, there were some 215 railroad companies in England. Additional problems emerged begging policy attention. One was the amount of time the legislature was spending on the private acts, one for each firm. Could generic legislation be stated and action delegated to some creature of the legislature? Debate continued on this prior to the 1844 Act, and a proposal was developed, but there's no full response to this problem until 1872, when the Railroad and Canal Traffic Act created a railroad commission and gave it powers. This was about 15 years before the Interstate Commerce Commission was created in the United States. An interesting aspect of the 1844 debate treated government ownership. Using the turnpike model of reverting to government ownership, it was recommended that newly chartered railroads become the property of the government after 21 years, compensating their owners at reasonable prices. 
Another problem was the growing complexity of commodities to be moved. Classification was the name of the game, as was the basing of rates on the value of the product. Traders pressed the railroads hard for advantages in order to attract traffic, and classification and rates began to be complex. Around 300 articles were recognized by 1850, and by 1871, the number had grown to 2,753. Classes were recognized, articles were placed within classes, and charges for them were related to class rates. The situation was more complex than just the increase of articles and classes would suggest. With the growth of the economy and trade, more and more shipments moved over multiple properties. By the 1880s, there were 40,000 stations between which shipments could move. Some system-wide referee standardizing rates had to be established. Would government do this? Not at first. Although government did pass lots of acts relating to rates, the railroads created a clearinghouse to do the rate work and to articulate shipments among roads. Government action mainly responded to claims that the firms were making too much money. Maximum rates should be reduced. Government tried to protect the public from monopolies by authorizing competitive lines and controlling amal amalgamations. It gave running powers to railroads that were locked out of markets. Most researchers say that government actions were not very effective. Government control of rates was ineffective partly because control was aimed at line haul charges. Carriers could set terminal rates and collector distributor rates. The classification rate problem was settled by mutual government industry action. The clearinghouse had enforcement problems and government had its problems. Clearinghouse worked with Parliament's Board of Trade. The act did more. It extended to terminal charges and it introduced tapered rates. In this small way, the act, for the first time, related charges to costs. Previous acts in 1868 and 1873 had required that rates be published and that charges be itemized. Government got involved in setting rates because while the railroads could get some agreements on rates, an authority was needed to enforce agreements. Once government got involved, it did begin to exert some social policy influence. The requirement for the publishing of rates reduced the problem of asymmetric information between users and service suppliers. The above discussion treats a lot of borrowing and learning. First, the railroads and government borrowed from previous experience. Next, they responded in pragmatic ways to the rail experience. The overarching challenge was to deal with complexity. Government worked with railroads to create institutions for that purpose. Six point seven learning about embedded policies, the org chart. The discussions to this point have stressed how railroads began by borrowing policies from previous modes and then modified policies based on experiences. A similar statement may be made about government. Passenger and freight services were examined. Now the discussion turns to how policies became embedded within the structure of the mode. By the late 1800s, many small rail starts had been absorbed by larger systems and strong large systems had emerged. Within railroad embedded policies evolved to manage these large systems, namely functional and departmentalized administrative structures for day-to-day -day routine operating decisions with precise accountability for expenses and use of human resources. The telegraph provided operational control on an hourly basis for trains and on a daily basis for expenditures, work performed by men and machines, and freight and passenger movements. These innovations are attributed to D.C. McCollum of the Erie Railroad beginning in 1854. They were widely publicized and served as a model for other railroads and for industry generally. J. Edgar Thompson of the Pennsylvania Railroad, who, after adopting McCollum's scheme, divided the Pennsylvania into operating divisions in 1857, took the next step. Each division had a superintendent in charge of three functions, transportation, way, and equipment. The headquarters superintendent and the division superintendents were delegated operating authority over men and machinery. Headquarters was primarily involved with finance and planning and rules and procedures. Other railroads in the U.S. quickly adopted this organizational system. Adoption elsewhere seems to have been slower, mainly because systems were smaller. As noted above, the transportation systems have a three-component triad structure. Fixed facilities created and managed by civil engineers through, for instance, a public works department or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Equipment designed and manufactured by mechanical engineers through, for example, General Motors or North America Car. And vehicles operated by pilots, train engineers, or drivers. Mirroring that structure, railroads are organized as shown in the figure. The answer to the question of why railroads are organized that way requires a little discussion. That was the division of talent and problems at the time. 
For the other modes, modeled on railroads is a good first approximation to the answer to the question of why they are organized the way they are. But this structure yields considerable dysfunctions. The question is that of why modes have continued to be organized in triad structures in light of the dysfunctions. That's especially a question for railroads. As corporate entities, they should be able to adopt restructuring policies more easily than the other modes. We may term one dysfunction the inability to make markets. A conversation with a railroad person would be misleading. Most of them can tell all about the goods being hauled and why. Those that have to know have deep knowledge of the trading terms and transportation costs interrelations in the capturing of markets. They know that a cent here and there, or a quality of service attribute here, can change the terms of transport. But the level of freight movement knowing by railroad people has an important constraint on it. Railroad people do not have sharp knowledge of the cost to the railroad when making a market. The reason is structural. Each division of the railroad claims a budget to carry forward its task, and each tries to minimize costs and or to maximize output from given inputs. At the level of a geographical division, for example, the transportation operations manager sees certain tons to be moved. Given the equipment and fixed facility situation, a good manager keeps the transportation inputs required to a minimum. Individual shipments move across divisions and impose costs on way, equipment, and operations. Shipments are handled jointly with other shipments in different combinations at different places and times, so it is very difficult to identify the cost of a particular shipment. Railroad people know this very well, and they give a lot of attention to costing. Indeed, Wellington's The Economics of Railroad Location, written in the late 1800s, centered on cost information and its use. Where special services are offered, such as unit trains on heavy haul routes, cost information may be pretty good. Some railroad marketing departments are organized by commodities and try to match costs and services as best they can. Even so, there's a long-standing dysfunction locked in by structure. The situation is worse in other modes where the structure is not within mode-wide organizations. In air transport, for example, we have authorities that operate airports, a federal aviation administration that manages the airways, and airlines and private operators that move passengers. Individual firms, such as trucking companies and shipbuilders, know their costs and markets, of course. System costs are another matter. No one is in charge. In the economist's pure, atomistic world, if there were perfect competition, that is of no great concern. But structural interdependencies in transport are strong. Spatial monopolies exist, and competition is far from ideal. The second dysfunction is associated with patterns of dynamic decision-making. The operations group on the railroad measures costs on a car basis, so they press the equipment division to buy larger cars. That's acceptable to equipment managers because it lowers their costs but it's been found that large, heavy cars impose lots of costs on track structure. What has happened is that incremental decisions were made on the basis of component criteria, subject only to the conditions that it fit the system in a technical way. Examples of this kind of behavior proliferate throughout the modes. For instance, truckers buy high-pressure radial tires and ignore pavement damage questions. Sometimes this component suboptimization begs remedial policy, as was the case when drivers started to use snow tires with metal studs. Often policy is faulty because it fails to consider the system environment. In rail, there is policy about the condition of track and speed limits that pays no attention, as it should, the type of equipment ordered. One term for this pattern is a behavior of disjoint incrementalism. Incrementalism allows exploration of objects in cases where wants are unknown, enables reversible and low-risk decision, stabilizes organizations, permits compromise among goals and stakeholders, and has other desirable attributes. Perhaps stasis from constrained behavior gives an additional flavor to the idea we strive to communicate. Actors in a component of a mode are constrained to do things that fit the structure of the mode, and actors' goals, values, and priorities are constrained to their component. As a consequence of the constrained behavior of components, systems have a highly constrained path of system development. The options that can be explored are very, very limited, for example. Actions may be costly because of impacts on others. We think the limitations on the exploration of options are the major cost of disjoint incrementalism. When is this failure costly? It is clearly costly when systems age. Inability to change is one reason they sail along in the sunshine of their obsolescence. It can be costly early on because it can lock in dysfunctions. Policy bearing on Brunel's wide gauge railways is an example. One dysfunction following from the organization of systems is an environmental fallacy. Centralizing actions are taken under the false pretext of crisis and urgency without considering the environment and feedbacks from environmental adjustments. That thought could be used at the level of how components interrelate with each other 
and at larger scope. This is distinct from the ecological fallacy in which inferences about the individual are made from aggregates of which they are a part. Six point eight, learning about rules, the code of operations. As would be expected from our discussion of technology and as seen, the railroads borrowed policies from previous experience. For example, the first charters for railroads were modeled on those for canals, as already mentioned. Temporal organization was also borrowed. With respect to embedded policies, management and operations policies were borrowed from military and industrial experiences. Military borrowing resulted in style or corporate cultural features. Such borrowing was necessary because of the geographical span of railroads and requirements that systems operate in a reliable fashion. In order to take an action, the actions of others elsewhere must be highly predictable. The railroads borrowed from the military and especially from industry, the policy of operations by rules. Clear, carefully stated rules were necessary for predictability, for the training of labor, and assuring task responsibility. Workers who had lived for years with nature's clock and contracting for independent tasks, I will bring in your crop this fall, had to be trained to do coordinated things at specific times. To accomplish this, the law book of the Crowley Iron Works, late 1700s, contained 100,000 words. Modeled on such rules, especially Josiah Wedgwood's Chinaware factory rules, the Liverpool and Manchester opened for business with a well-developed rules and regulations book. The American Standard Code of Operations Regulations of 1887 illustrates the heavy hand of early beginnings. 6.9, learning about time, the rise of the time zone. We, of course, have always had time, but its importance has changed over the centuries. Before attention to time was imposed by the Industrial Revolution and standard time invented by the railroads, lives ran on time measured by the days and seasons and benchmarked by church and state holidays, seasonal fairs, and other events. Work was organized by the job, say, contracting to bring in the hay, for a two-year trip on an India voyage, or for a midsummer between planting and harvesting season, raid on neighboring kingdoms. Factory work and the spread of precursor and modern transport systems restructured the daily, weekly, and annual activity paradigm. Employers imposed time contracts, much like the corvée, which required peasants to give six days a year or more to the government to maintain the roads, although nominally these contracts were voluntary. These contracts said, be there and at, stay until, a weekly rhythm emerged, and people had to learn to work in tandem with others at specific times and places. For transport, the operation of scheduled services, as on rail, required time coordination to ensure reliability and safety, just as ships had watches. Rail service also learned from the military, which heeded time's beat to beat the enemy. Transport was no mere user of time. The transport sector fashioned tools for time. While the clock and calendar are old, Transport required precision timekeeping and coordination. Measurement of longitude required precise portable timekeeping devices. The issue was so important that the British government established the Longitude Act in 1714, and the Board of Longitude, which would award a prize of £20,000, a nice sum today, but huge for the time, to anyone who could develop an accurate and practical measure of time at sea. The timekeeping devices developed by John Harrison would evolve into the portable watches required by train conductors. Standardized railroad and air services needed Greenwich Mean Time. Of course, such time was an arbitrary invention established as standard by the Prime Meridian Conference in 1884. That conference followed on the heels of a Sunday morning, November 18, 1883, which was dubbed the Day of Two Noons in the United States, as those in the eastern parts of the four time zones had a second noon to comport with the western part of those zones. Today's global positioning system provides sufficiently accurate time and location that people are considering using it, or at least the next generation of GPS, for vehicle control, for instance, keeping cars in their lanes. This mode of living, activity scheduled by time and requiring specialized inputs, extensive use of capital and machinery, and requirements for tandem or sequential activities emerged in the 1800s and now dominates life and thinking. Consider, for example, the public school system, which teaches students to live and work in the mode established by the Industrial Revolution. So transport and the Industrial Revolution frame the modern perception of time, and thus our daily schedule. Six point ten: Learning about travel or information. Today, with GPS satellite navigation systems built into cars and ubiquitous mobile phones, with on-demand access to the internet, with information about everything at one's fingertips, 
it is hard to imagine a time with so much less. As a complement to the new transport systems arose new guides which would enable tourists, relatively rare until the railway, to travel far beyond their experience with information about where to go and how to get there. Many guidebooks arose. George Bradshaw developed what came to be known as Bradshaw's Guide. At first, they were railway timetables, which of itself was quite important, since there were more than 150 different operators with many routes and schedules each, which changed frequently. Bradshaw also produced a Bradshaw's Tourist Guide. Michael Portillo, a retired British politician, a former future prime minister, used that guide to revisit Victorian England in a television series, Great British Railway Journeys. In England and its colonies, the term Bradshaw was genericized to be used for any railway guide. Other famous guides of the railway era included the German published Beidecker's Guide. In France, the guide Michelin was sponsored from the early 20th century by the eponymous tire company to aid travelers in the choice of hotels and most famously restaurants. This emerged with the automobile rather than the railway, which brought about a further revolution in how people traveled. Travelers needed information not only about their trip, but the world. Newsstands such as W. H. Smith in 1848 in England and Hachette 1852 in France arose at railway stations to keep passengers entertained and informed. These complementary goods, along with other facilities at train stations, restaurants, hotels, booking offices, and waiting rooms, presage the rise of the roadside rest areas, areas in the highway era. Six point eleven. Learning about right of way. The conflict between land for access and land for activity. Consider early roads, trails, ways, and river or beach landings. Services were ubiquitous and suited the traffic. A way was a zone along which the public has a right of movement, the right of way. It was a path that, perhaps, shifted seasonally and was suitable for people and their pack animals as well as other animals walking to market. The term way describes many routes. A way is important. But as property rights are established, one needs a right of way in order to build a transport system. What was government involvement in obtaining land? What did government learn? What policy evolved? Property conflicts occurred as landowners sought to fence property for field crops and restricted amount of way available. In many places, the abutting property owner had an obligation, but little incentive to maintain the road. In England, the enclosure movement made establishing public ways more difficult. The idea of a way emerged in the United States when the Midwest and Plain states were being settled. The government retained title to mile-wide strips. These sections would be used as ways for long-distance movement, an important matter when animals walked to market. TV westerns often featured conflicts between cattle drives and settlers and their plots. Turnpikes and canals required land taking by trusts and firms. These were typically small undertakings. The enabling acts passed by central governments endorsed local agreements and contained details on the land to be taken and prices to be paid. Large landowners typically were actors in the promoting organizations and would not use land ownership to hold up or block development. We have some evidence that the tramway land taking problem was more difficult, perhaps because mine and transport operators were often not part of the land gentry. For example, the first charter for the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the tramway charter, was requested in 1819. The Duke of Cleveland's concerns about disruption to his fox dens and the consequences for his hunt stalled construction of the railway for about two years, so the charter was not obtained until 1821. The London and Birmingham Railway posed a new problem. It was not a local undertaking. Birmingham businessmen largely promoted it. It was strongly opposed by the owners of canals serving that market and points between. Its enabling act could not be an endorsement of proposed deals. It said that market value would be paid for land and treated the matter of partial takings. This protected investors as well as those whose property was taken. This is what the Enabling Act said, but there was a good bit of evidence that acts were obtained by buying off opposition. In an address to the British Institute of Civil Engineers, Stevenson remarked, with perhaps some rhetorical flourish, that the cost of obtaining the Enabling Act for the London and Birmingham was not much less than the cost of constructing the entire line. He remarked, Great was the ingenuity of the agent who discovered the use of the word severance and went on to call it a system of spoilation permitted by Parliament. If the opposition could not be bought off, the railroad had to avoid the property. That requirement caused the building of long tunnels on the London and Birmingham and building the Liverpool and Manchester through the Chad Moss. Moss, short for morass, is described as a wet and dreary waste composed of peat, and it is named for St. Chad.
Two things seem to have muted the conflicts between rural landowners and the railroads. First, with experience, rural landowners found that railroad construction was to their advantage and began to try to attract routes. For instance, Lords Derby and Sefton, who, by their opposition, had forced the Liverpool and Manchester through the Chad Moss, became patrons for a rival line on the condition that it would pass through their property. Chad Moss, which had been worthless, suddenly became valuable. Second, the railroads offered productivity improvements. They could afford to pay through the nose if needed. The profits were there. The construction of railroads into cities posed very difficult property-taking problems. The railroad map of London, for example, shows that railroads were unable to penetrate into the urban core and that the railroads were much more successful in taking land from the poor and powerless than from the rich. Workmen's trains were one consequence. The poor had to move to the suburbs and were given low-cost commuter trains. The situation yesterday was no different from today. Many of today's urban transport problems are conflicts in the location of fixed facilities. For example, debates about roads, docks, and airports stress undesirable visual noise and air pollution, congestion spillover to adjoining areas, destruction of neighborhoods, and so on. What did we learn when conflicts at debate were between people and their possessions and activities in the new kid on the block, the railroad? Not much. Every city has its own story, and each story is idiosyncratic. The influence of city morphology differed because of site differences between cities, and there's a cut between those cities well established prior to the coming of the railroad and those where the turf was not so occupied. The conflicts differ by facility type. Passenger and freight terminals, yards, routes, facilities such as shops, etc. Finally, the situation changed with time. Some railroads invaded cities and public street property. Electrification was pushed by the need to use tunnels and the problems with urban environments as in Baltimore and Paris, and later New York and London. The lack of union stations, the rail terminal problem, is a long-standing consequence of this situation. In London, many stations, several nearly adjacent, competed for business. The clock on the King's Cross Tower disagreed with the one ne on the next door St. Pancras. Victoria Station has two railway companies separated by a wall. As a result of differing temporal and morphological situations, the literature tends to be city-specific. One can find multiple books on London and Chicago. Chapter-length discussions often appear in rail or city histories. Many cities have studied location problems, penned reports, and have sometimes taken action. Simmons treats places large and small in England to compress his remarks on London. Railroad passenger facilities penetrated into the city in varying degrees. During the 1830s, only three of six went well into the built-up area, and only one place its terminal within the Corporation of London, the city proper. Construction was costly, and additional costs were incurred as traffic grew. Fragmented land ownership was especially a problem. Many small properties were demolished, and the process was generally thought salutary in clearing away noisome dwellings that fostered disease and crime. Viaducts and cuttings became barriers. Replacements for housing demolished became a requirement in 1874, as did compensation to those forced to move. However, those requirements were not enforced very well. Facilities were needed for car storage and sorting, transshipment of less than car load lot, LCL, traffic, teaming yards, and access to large shippers. Although very demanding of land, little is said in the literature about freight transport conflicts in cities. In many cities, long viaducts were built across yards. These were a precursor experience for limited access highways. Pressure was exerted to elevate or tunnel heavily used routes. This was a force for electrification of railways. Many cities wanted union stations. In the absence of union stations, interline transfers were arranged in difficult ways, for example, through the use of the underground in London and through the circumferential rail routes in other cities. Yet the rail experience did not influence other urban facility policy, such as freeway policy, as strongly as it should have. Opportunities to improve facilities and take advantage of improved and larger vehicles emerged. A critical point is the changing relationship between fixed facility costs and operating costs. Costly but more efficient and higher quality facilities emerged. Seaports and airports, limited access roads, and carefully engineered rail facilities, subways, and elevated transit. Now the rule is to achieve lower door-to-door -door travel times, carry heavier loads, go safely with less stress, and save money. Traffic has been concentrated in accommodating that traffic as required land. Land for container and bulk shipment ports, for multi-lane freeways, and for airports and railroad yards. Graceful abandonment and reuse of land has generally not been achieved. Concentration and growth of traffic has also deepened issues of externalities, noise, air pollution, and so on. In principle, one can tunnel for highways just as one tunnels for deep subways. Disruptive cut and cover is not required.
French highway planning is taking advantage of tunnels, segregated to separate cars and trucks and thereby allowing more vehicles and less volume. Linking districts of Paris, for instance, being used on the Paris Beltway, Orbital Expressway A86. Similar suggestion for the widespread use of small tunnels was discussed by Garrison in 1974. Externalities, especially those generated by traffic, make transport land use undesirable for neighbors. Construction of facilities has downsides too. Dust, mud, noise, and disruption of traffic have their costs. The construction gangs and others associated with the building of the Erie Canal were not good neighbors. We need to improve our ability to remember and use experiences. The rail experiences in urban areas continued through the decades. Problems did too, and many remain today. New construction is not so much at issue today, but there remain local issues of routes around cities, consolidation of terminals and lines, noise and congestion at yards and terminals, grade separation and the provision of workmen's trains, today's commuter service. Still, with respect to land taking and environmental insult, highway designers failed to learn from the rail experience. Some difficulties in transport modes obtaining right-of-way results from the resulting negative externalities. An externality is an effect that occurs to a third party. While the railroad and its passengers engage in an economic transaction, an externality, positive or negative, is what happens as a result of that transaction, which befalls other individuals. The gains in accessibility must offset the costs, including environmental costs. The discussions above imply some conflicts between transport and the environment, and a few instances were mentioned. Trains were dirty and noisy compared to previous modes, and they were broadly disruptive of previous ways of life. Highways bring construction which disturbs parks and cars, which spew filth into our skies. As something new, railroads were viewed as an environmental insult. Later, they were accepted as part of the landscape. Landowners opposed canals. The thought of having their land cut through and separated by canals was far from appealing to them. He goes on to say, in general, though, the canal was soon appreciated as an attractive addition to the landscape. These stately roads, as Wordsworth called them. With respect to railroads, there was a torrent of opposition in England. It is not clear how much of this opposition was disruption of the natural environment related and how much was addressed to the broad changes induced by the railroad. Charles Dickens, for example, was very anti-railroad. Elsewhere, he complained about smoke and noise. Complaints gradually declined, and the railroad was gradually accepted as part of the rural landscape. Conservatives, not in the American political sense, but in the maintenance of the present world sense, oppose change. New facilities, and especially new technologies, bring change. Eventually, the change is brought, and the new facility becomes old, a part of the environment. Opposition before evolves to acceptance after. That is not saying that given time, we should sweep environmental problems under the rug. It's what we learned from the rail and previous experiences. Six point twelve, learning about alliances. The organization chart eased the problem of within railroad embedded policies, but not the making markets or profit cost centers problem. Developing between railroad embedded policies proved tougher. In the post Civil War decade, there were four major systems connecting the East Coast with terminals just west of the Allegheny Mountains, and those trunk lines sought alliances with Western railroads and steamship lines to curb rate wars. Some purchased stock in the Western roads and all made agreements on through rates and services, but this did not go smoothly because individual roads could gain by seeking favorable changes in the status quo. Jay Gould sought such changes when he gained control of the Erie in 1867. A variety of supplemental techniques were attempted. The Vanderbilts, for example, sought to federate the New York Central with lines to the west. The western railroads, which were generally weaker than the eastern trunk lines, sought to pull receipts in order to reduce motives for price wars. These efforts were unsuccessful, and in 1877, the Eastern Railroads formed the Eastern Trunk Line Association, headed by Albert Fink. This was soon joined by a similar Midwestern and New England organizations. With the several organizations unified by common executive committee, the regional organizations determined rates and classifications, which were then adopted for the areas covered. Things seemed to have worked smoothly for about a decade until Gould and the Vanderbilts became aggressors in this non-zero-sum game. The figure indicates the size of the properties that we have been discussing, at a date a little later than the period we have been discussing. Alliances prove to be important in maritime and aviation sectors as well, and are used within many cities to organize the private provision of taxi, jitney, and bus services.
6.13 Profile Cornelius Vanderbilt. According to legend, in 1810, at the age of 16, Cornelius Vanderbilt, 1784 to 1877, borrowed $100 from his mother to purchase a paraugur, a type of boat, and began to ferry passengers from Staten Island to Manhattan. His business expanded, and he soon was also the business manager for Thomas Gibbons' steam-powered ferry between New Jersey and New York. Gibbons was challenging the monopoly that had been granted by New York State to Robert Fulton and Robert Livingston, and which had been sold to Aaron Ogden. Ultimately, in the United States Supreme Court case Gibbons v. Ogden, that monopoly on Hudson River steamboat traffic was broken, as it was the interstate travel and could not be regulated by the states. In 1829, Vanderbilt left Gib Gibbons' firm, now owned by Thomas Gibbons' son, William, and started expanding his own ferry business. Cornelius Vanderbilt, along with former President John Quincy Adams, were aboard a train of the Camden and Amboy Railroad on November 8, 1833, on the first U.S. train crash involving death of passengers, similar to the first United Kingdom crash discussed previously. Vanderbilt broke a leg and swore off train travel, a vow he would eventually break. Vanderbilt acquired other lines on the Hudson from his brother Jacob and lines on Long Island Sound. On the Hudson, he faced competition from Daniel Drew, who entered the steamship business in 1831. Drew forced Vanderbilt to buy him out. Drew and Vanderbilt became secret partners for 30 years to avoid competition. Vanderbilt's The People's Line served the Hudson from Albany to New York City against an entrenched monopoly and was eventually bought out itself. So, he moved most of his operation to Long Island Sound. He soon extended his transport networks from water to land, acquiring feeder railroads. One of his strategies was to acquire competing lines to his target, lower rates on his own line, drive down the share price of his competitor, and acquire it at a discount. He used this to acquire the New York, Providence, and Boston Railroad, called the Stonington. He also took over the Staten Island Ferry in 1838. He sought to build a canal across Nicaragua, and while that was not to be, he did ferry passengers across Lake Nicaragua in the San Juan River on his accessory transit company, combined with road travel. This served the markets of migrants to California, which was exploding with a gold rush. While more than half of migrants chosen overland through the United States route to California in this period at a cost of $200 per person, this was only one-third the cost of the water journey around the Cape Horn, taking five to eight months, or going to Central America by boat and through Central America by mule, taking five to eight weeks, as promoted by Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt lost control of the accessory transit company once American filibuster, unauthorized military expeditionary, William Walker, gained control of Nicaragua. Vanderbilt helped to drive Walker out in the 1850s, but could not get control of his line back from the subsequent government, and so started a new transportation line in Panama and split the market with the incumbent operator, Pacific Mail. Uncommonly, Panama had a railway before a canal. Ferdinand de Lesseps, who built the Suez Canal, attempted a canal across Panama and acquired the Panama Railway, but the project failed as Panama is difficult to work in and was not amenable to a lockless canal. The Americans later completed the canal. Six point fourteen. Learning about finance, the Erie War. He who sells what isn't his and must buy it back or go to prison. Daniel Drew. From eighteen sixty three, Cornelius Vanderbilt acquired more railroads. Beginning with the New York and Harlem Railroad, he started accumulating the network to connect New York with Chicago, which by eighteen seventy comprised the New York Central and Hudson Railroad, then valued at one hundred million dollars, the most successful of the Northeast lines which was able to pay dividends through the Panic of 1873. His methods were harsh. He cut off feeder traffic to force a downstream company into his control. He cornered the market in stocks to punish short-selling public officials. Short-selling is selling stocks you don't own with the hope of buying them back later at a lower price, and is in contrast with going long on a stock or buying it with the expectation it will rise in price. Clearly, if the price does not fall, a short seller will lose money. If someone can acquire a majority of the outstanding stock and an insufficient amount of stock is available for short sellers to purchase, their losses can be astronomical. In one of his few failures, Vanderbilt got into a bidding war over the Erie Railroad. The Erie War brought together a cast of some of America's most important financiers and railroad men in a battle over a second-tier railroad. Daniel Drew, 1797 to 1879, was once Vanderbilt's partner. He became a stockbroker in 1844 and joined the board of the Erie Railroad in 1857. 
He shorted the stock of the New York and Harlem Railroad and lost a fortune in 1864. After the Erie War with Vanderbilt in 1870, Fisk and Gould then played Drew, causing him to lose $1.5 million. The Panic of 1873 was no aid, and Drew filed for bankruptcy and died penniless. James, Diamond Jim Fisk, 1835-1872, made his first fortune dealing in army contracts in the U.S. Civil War. While he lost this wealth in speculation after the war, he worked for Daniel Drew's brokerage. The famous Black Friday of 1869 resulted from Fisk and Gould's failed attempt to corner the gold market. After the Erie War, Fisk had a scandalous affair with a showgirl, Josie Mansfield, which ultimately broke off when Mansfield took up with Fisk associate Edward Stokes, who then attempted to blackmail Fisk for his illegal doings. Fisk had no part of that, and Stokes killed Fisk in 1872 and went to prison for four years. Fisk was remembered as a populist loathed by high society. Jay Gould, 1836-1892, about the same age as Fisk, but much younger than Drew, was a surveyor and historian, and then formed a tanning business. It was the Panic of 1857 which moved him to high finance, when he bought out his partner's properties for himself. As with any good on-the-edge capitalist, this led to some violent kerfuffles, but Gould profited and soon used his profits to invest in the Rutland and Washington Railroad. He acquired a reputation of being able to move markets by cornering the market in gold in 1869, culminating in Black Friday, when the price of gold collapsed. After the Erie War, and then being forced out of that railroad, he acquired the Missouri Pacific, Union Pacific, and Western Union, and transit routes in New York City, among other properties. At one time, he held 15% of all U.S. rail mileage. When crushing the 1886 Great Southwest Railroad strike, he is reported to have said, I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. These three, Daniel Drew, one-time partner of Cornelius Vanderbilt, James Fisk, and Jay Gould, illegally issued watered-down stock in the Erie Railroad, much of which was purchased by Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was aiming to get control. Watered-down stock entails the issuing of additional stock in a company, increasing the company's par value. Suppose a company has issued 10,000 shares of stock initially in exchange for $10,000 of capital. The stock would be watered if the company acquired, say, $1,000 of additional real assets in exchange for $2,000 in stock. The value of the other stock would in reality be worth less, since the total company assets were now $11,000, but there were 12,000 shares outstanding. Each share was only worth $0.91 cents instead of $1. This process is no longer done, as such, since par value is now nominal on companies, and the last court case involving water stock was in 1956. The more control Vanderbilt wanted, the more stock Drew, Fisk, and Gould issued, costing Vanderbilt $7 million between 1866 and 1868. While much of that was repaid to Vanderbilt, Gould himself could not retain the Erie. This was due to a strange immigrant. Lord Gordon Gordon, also known as Lord Glencairn Honorable Mr. Herbert Hamilton, George Herbert Gordon, George Gordon, George Hubert Smith, and John Herbert Charles Gordon, migrated from Britain to North America in 1870. He was not a lord, as many Americans and Canadians later learned, merely impersonating a Scottish peer to borrow money to buy land. He landed in Minnesota in 1871 and deposited 20,000 pounds in a local bank, establishing legitimacy. He promised to invest $5 million to help resettle 100 Scottish families on land managed for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Colonel Loomis, the land commissioner for the Northern Pacific, spent $45,000 touring with Lord Gordon Gordon through rural Minnesota. While still leading Minnesota on, Lord Gordon Gordon, using letters of introduction from Colonel Loomis, soon moved to New York. On the train ride east, he befriended the wife of James Fisk. In 1872, he convinced Gould that he and his European friends already owned some 60,000 shares of the Erie Railroad, and he could help Gould acquire control of the board of directors of the Erie in exchange for $1 million in stock as part of a pooling of interest. Upon receiving the stock, Gordon Gordon promptly sold it, worsening Gould's position. Gould sued, and Gould's friends in New York City, in New York City's Tammany Hall, then under the reign of their ally in Erie Railroad, fellow board member Boss Tweed, had Gordon Gordon arrested. But Gordon Gordon made bail based on the reputation of his purported European friends and promptly fled to Manitoba before such information could be confirmed and before his history caught up with him. 600 shares of Erie, some 1,900 corporations affiliated with Erie, and 4,722 of the Oil Creek and Allegheny Valley Railroad, $21,000 bonds of the Nyack and Northern Railroad, and $160,000 in currency. $160,000 
The careful recipient of these securities and cash presently found an error of $40,000 in the footing of Gould's memorandum and sent word of the shortage. Gould did not think there was such an error, but under the circumstances he would not dispute the point and came back with an additional $40,000 in cash. To a modest request for a memorandum receipt, his lordship replied with exceeding dignity that his word of honor ought to be receipt enough and handed the bundle back to Gould. Gould took it, went as far as the door, returned, laid it down, and departed in faith that his property was in safe hands. It must have been sheer sport in playing a fish which had taken his hook so greedily that led Gordon to demand that Gould separate himself from the old directorate. On March 9th, Gould delivered to him his resignation as director and president of the Erie Railroad Company to take effect upon the appointment of his successor. The Great Covenant was complete. Gordon Gordon offered to buy large parts of Manitoba from the government, which appealed to locals there. But soon his American enemies found out and sent a posse of bounty hunters to bring him back to the United States. This posse included two future governors of Minnesota and three future members of Congress. They successfully kidnapped Gordon Gordon, but were stopped by the Mounties in Winnipeg and put in prison themselves. The governor of Minnesota put the state militia on alert, and President Grant authorized sending an army into Manitoba, and a major international incident between Canada and the U.S. was threatened. To avoid conflict, Canada released the posse but Gordon Gordon was already freed. Then his European enemies asked for his extradition on similar charges of swindling a jeweler of 25,000 pounds, and Canada agreed. Making his escape again, Gordon Gordon was again arrested and again released on bail. But before his extradition in 1874, he held a party, gave gifts to his local friends, and then shot himself. Gould's loss of $1 million in stock may have been sufficient to cost him the Erie Railroad. The Erie War was, of course, not the only instance of shenanigans in rail finance. Two other examples follow. The United Kingdom had a scandal involving the Hammersmith and City Line, wherein the chairman of the board and another director acquired land on the proposed route before the company did to earn great profits. The Union Pacific Railway was famous for the Credit Mobilier scandal, in which the Union Pacific officials ensured the Credit Mobilier of America Company, in which they held an interest, was issued construction contracts to great profit. The ringleader was Congressman Oakes Ames of Massachusetts, who held off congressional inquiry by buying off public officials with discounted shares in credit mobilier. It is not clear how many similar cases were not caught. Six point fifteen comments by social critics. We do not ride on the railroad, it rides upon us. Henry David Thoreau, Walden. The railroad has been an important symbol in literature and a subject of social critics. Charles Dickens' writings fall in the same period as the rise of the railway, and he had much to say about its emergence and growth, and his views changed over time. In Dombey and Son, Dickens portrayed the railroad as a symbol of power and ruthlessness. In The Uncommercial Traveler, he said, I left Dullborough in the days when there were no railroads in the land. I left it in a stagecoach. I was cavalierly shunted back into Dullborough the other day by train and the first discovery I made was that the station had swallowed up the playing field. It was gone. The beautiful hawthorn trees, the hedge, the turf, and all those buttercups and daisies had given place to the stoniest of jolting roads. While, beyond the station, an ugly, dark monster of a tunnel kept its jaws open, as if it had swallowed them and were ravenous for more destruction. Nathaniel Hawthorne indicated considerable resentment of railroads in his American notebook. The rose Walden was kinder. Commenting on hearing a train, he said, it seems as if the earth has now got a race worthy to inhabit it. Finally, the press also had fun. Indiana and Indianans said, we renew an idea which we have propounded before, but which has been lost sight of by railroad managers and by our citizens. Namely, that an unnecessary number of trains are run on our railroads to accommodate travelers from distant states, and that on train daily would be all the passenger business that is now done on any of the roads. This extravagance is wrong and ought not to be continued. I have no doubt that to change would add 8 to 10 percent to the dividends to suit these railroads. They should arrange their running in time to suit the citizens of Indiana and not those of Massachusetts or Texas. All trains should arrive in the city between 11 and 12 a.m. and leave it at 1 or 2 o'clock p.m. The roads of New York are sought to pass through a portion of Pennsylvania without conferring any advantage upon the state, in fact drawing away trade from her own metropolis and conferring no local advantage, even upon Erie, unless there was a break of gauge. If the foreign companies succeed in their schemes, there is one great monopoly of railroad interest from Albany to Chicago, rich and powerful enough to buy out or trample upon any rival interest, 
combining the moneyed power, which is without a parallel in the history of the country. We propose making it eerie or breaking this interest, and it is this, in reality, which the railroad fear. The references to Erie, Pennsylvania, and its situation is shown in the partial map of the Nickel Plate Railroad, the New York, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad Company, in the figure. Interestingly, Erie is today's location of much of General Electric's transportation equipment manufacturing, suggesting perhaps the railroad did offer some advantage. The anxiety associated with the railroad finds parallels today with the concern of the all-consuming, sprawling city and the shrinking countryside.